next uh, individual is uh, Dr. Wayne Bell. He's a senior associate at Washington College for the Environment and Society. Uh, Dr. Bell is the compiler of the annual St. Michael's Christmas Bird Count. He's going to discuss the recent bird counts and how they pertain to the uh, quail, woodcock, and the songbirds here on the shore. <coughs> Thank you, Mac. I've um, been reading the uh, Star Democrat of late. Uh, one of my colleagues at the uh, Talbot chapter of the Ornithological Society, or you may know it as the Talbot Bird Club, said, how long has your wife been working for the newspaper? It seems like uh, since the bird count, I've been in the thing uh, for uh, about four or five times. And uh, it's interesting. I worked for Washington College for five years with working on farmland preservation and Visioning and Talbot County and everything else never made the front page, and now we're on the front page four times. I, I figured they must have found my photo at the uh, post office or something like that. Any case, um, let me actually summarize a couple of points I want to make, and then I'll uh, uh, get to the more sobering data, if you will. Uh, and the points are this. Back in the uh, 60s, there was a, uh, a person who worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, still employed there, who was involved with the uh, North American Breeding Bird Survey, something I'll mention again in a moment and explain, named Sam Drogi. Sam wrote a book, uh, sorry, an article called for the uh, Maryland Audubon magazine called Maryland Efficiency and Birds. And in that, he went through a little bit of the history of land use in Maryland, how that had changed and how that affected bird populations, with an emphasis, of course, on songbirds. But in the end, he showed that, in fact, that very act of using the land, making it what we now call today, ecologists do, uh, call it a working landscape, <laughs> keeping it functioning and productive and, and so on, which many of our, most of our farmers attempt to do, that maintaining that working landscape was critical to maintaining the diversity of bird populations that we have in Maryland. And uh, he concluded by saying that to participate in the conservation of birds is to participate in the conservation of land. And uh, by that, he meant all kinds of land uses, not just, as, as many advocates are, the, the mature forest, which itself is kind of a myth, really. Uh, I give lots of talks and uh, written a bunch of them, uh, lots of PowerPoints and things that I did under the auspices of the college. and I past president of the Maryland Ornithological Society. And I'm available to, uh, to do this. My rates are reasonable. That is, I'm free to give you a much more of a, uh, a look at the history of land use in Maryland and how that's affected birds with uh, data and other observations. The other thing that I've been doing in getting onto the eastern shore working landscape is to work with young people out of Centerville, uh, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, Centerville Middle School, some other students from uh, Talbot County. We've been actually doing some research on the relationship between numbers of species and the size of, sizes of woodland islands in agriculture on the shore, and looking also at options for various conservation and land management bits. So we've been out there a long time. About uh, two years ago, one of the major statewide projects completed, uh, which was the second breeding bird atlas of Maryland. And the book has just come out. It was talked about in the Star Democrat. It's available from the Ornithological Society, or you can get a cheaper copy uh, from Amazon. It compares this atlas, which ended in uh, 2006, with one that was completed 20 years ago, the first such atlas. It's a breeding bird atlas, so it deals largely with birds that actually nest, breed, or whatever in Maryland. But it does have compilations of data and species descriptions for the 200 or so species that actually occur in Maryland. And many of them, of course, are of interest to you, the uh, rough grouse, northern bobwhite, and that sort of thing. I commend this very much. It's a beautiful job. Color in, uh, color this time, great maps of occurrences of the bird. And it involved a lot of your friends and neighbors who volunteered to do this. Uh, almost 1,000 people participated in a five-year project, including a lot of youngsters that got into birding because of the Atlas uh, project itself. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about very briefly are some sobering data from something else called the North American Breeding Bird Survey that was begun by Chandler Robbins, who is the grand old man of Maryland birding. Sure. Oh, that's not very nice. I'll take the ball. Okay. I'll get it back. It doesn't help. Um, Chandler Robbins uh, wrote one of the first field guides post Roger Torrey Peterson, the Golden Field Guide to North American Birds, and it's still one of the best selling. 
He is a local birder uh, who works out of Patuxent, now retired, approaching 90 years of age, still very active. In 19, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, yes, 1996, 1966, I'm sorry, he started this breeding bird survey, which is a attempt to do a roadside survey of the birds breeding across the country. There are now approximately 3,000 breeding bird survey routes, of which 2,000 plus are run each year strictly on a voluntary basis. I do too on the eastern shore. Each route is 49 and a half miles long. It is pre-set up so that you start and stop every half mile and you uh, jot down the number and species identification of all the birds seen within a half mile during a three minute interval. Then you hop in the car and try to do it again. Uh, you try to complete these things in three and a half or four hours starting right a uh, half hour before sunrise. That's the way it works. On the eastern shore there are about 17 or 18 active routes that have uh, been run under this thing out of the several thousand that are run nationwide and now it's beginning to move into the other parts of the Americas and Canada as well. All of the data are posted uh, online and maintained by the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge and you can actually query, if once you know what you're doing, you can query those data and get information out. What I've been doing for several years in working on workshops with uh, teachers and young people is to query the data and compile them for the uh, 18 or so routes on the eastern shore. And then take the average of them and look at trends of common species, some of which are quite familiar, like osprey or robin or catbird, and others of which are really important to you. And I'm going to pass this around because I promised Mac I wouldn't be showing any slides today. But on the front of this are the data for the northern Bob White from 1966 to, I just got it off the press, I was a little late for lunch today to do it, for 2010, that is last June. And you can see it's a monotonic decline, over 1% per year, and it hasn't bottomed out yet. This is for a compere, if you will, of northern Bob White, another grassland species, the eastern meadowlark. We don't have a lot of meadows anymore, we've gone to a different kind of agriculture, but this is another grassland species, a little less common than the Bob White, although now at their neck and neck, and it's been declining at uh, about a half a percent per year, again since 1966, with some big declines in the mid-70s. Now, if I showed you similar data for robins, or bluebirds, or great blue herons, or other breeding waterfowl in Maryland, I would actually be showing you good news. Those populations have been going up. Ducks Unlimited, with its work on the prairie pothole habitat conservation, has paid off in terms of our waterfowl populations. We're doing much better uh, for a lot of birds that had declined severely when I first moved back to Maryland in the 1980s. I'm going to pass this around. There's no reason why you can't have a look at it just to see what the numbers are like. But my point is this. These species and the cadre of species that are grassland, and apparently you know the term early successional habitats, those species are the ones right now nationwide that are in the most decline. Many of our warblers and others declined rapidly with the loss of forest land back, you know, in the 80s or so, but have stabilized and in fact are showing some increases. But our early successional species are not. And that poses two challenges for people interested in species breeding this way. One challenge is to identify early successional lands and to, as Drogi first suggested, participate in its conservation. It's no longer a waste space. It's really a habitat, and it's a critical habitat. The Bob Whites have declined so much that a few years ago I gave a talk to sixth graders in Elkton at one of their middle, uh, middle schools uh, that was located in a rural kind of environment there. And I showed them a picture of a Bob White and I played its song. They didn't know what it was. They knew bald eagles, they knew ospreys, they knew robins, they even knew catbirds, and a few knew a brown thrasher. <clears throat> they didn't know a Bob White. All of us who have grown up in rural America, that was one of the sounds of spring. And here's a generation that can't even recognize the bird anymore. So how are they going to even work to save it if they don't know what it is? The second challenge is this. You got your work cut out for you, not in just conserving the land, but the fact is early successional stages are temporary. They go on 
to become late successional stages and eventually young forests. And then eventually, if left alone, mature forests, oak and so on. The fact is that managing these habitats requires an active participation. The active factor of setting aside the land and then managing it so that it maintains itself in early successional stages. Farming is kind of like that as well, and so partnering with landowners who are farmers and so on really gets you to begin to see how you might be able to set up relationships with other landowners and other people to maintain those early successional stages. CREP is a good example of an attempt to do that, but understand CREP isn't very big around when it just surrounds fields and ditches, and it may not be enough habitat for the decline of some of these species to allow them to come back because lands that are small tend, and often along waste areas like ditches, which are important, of course, to our Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, also concentrate potential predators. And so the decline of our Bob White population is due, yes, to changes in our land use, but it's not that we're getting out there and plowing up nests. It has to do with marginalizing the available habitat for Bob White and also at the same time concentrating them in places where one, the habitat is less suitable, and two, there's more predation. So it's a complex, as ecology often is, ecological relationship, but the larger the habitat blocks, the better it gets. So those are the challenges, setting it aside in blocks large enough to make a difference, but also actively managing those lands for whatever purpose. The beauty is that we'll maintain the diversity of our working landscape, which is critical to the diversity of our bird species, be they songbirds or be they quarry and game. And at the same time, we're helping our own culture and society maintain a landscape that works instead of one that's simply pretty to look at. Thank you. <laughs>